the reason I call it a postmodern museum is just because um, the, the main events which led up to me creating the Institute happened in the postmodern area. Not that I'm um, a big postmodern uh, fan or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just that Marshall McLuhan's work um, happened mainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, you know, the second half of the 20th century, which we call postmodern. So it's not a, a museum of postmodernity, but a postmodern museum in that uh, for the museum aspect, um, the things that we're looking at and raising awareness about are events which happened um, mainly in the you know, second half of the 20th century. But coming up uh, from that as well, because um, Marshall's work, uh, well, he was an English professor for one thing for his entire career. But um, his work in culture and technology and communication um, really started in the 1950s. Uh, 1958, he first said the medium is the message. Um, and up until his death, uh, New Year's Eve 1980, um, his work, while he was always an English teacher, really focused on the effects of technologies. Uh, and my father, who started to work for him in the mid-late 60s, um, worked with him up until Marshall's death and then continued on from 1980 to 2018 when he died um, while we were away together in Colombia. Um, but Eric, uh, my father, uh, did the last um, couple decades of his work here in Prince Edward County. And that's where um, I had my sort of second part of my life uh, after growing up in Toronto. Um, and so here's, here's where I remain. And actually, I it's hard to imagine a better place, honestly. Um, Why do you say that? Well, when I first thought about starting something called the McLuhan Institute three years ago now, um, certain people said, oh, great, well, you know, you'll have to be in Toronto or New York City or L.A. even. And I said, no, you know, I mean, um, that's where Marshall did a lot of his work. And sure, those are the busy centers, but... Um, what we're looking at doing here is uh, contemplation and teaching and learning. And uh, the city environment is great for stimulation, not necessarily great for contemplation. So, uh, and this McLuhan work, understanding a phrase like the medium is the message, um, you can't just read a page and move on. It, it requires you to, to really consider things. And um, some people work well in a very distractive environment but mostly um, if you want to go deep into a subject you need to remove distractions um, and what better place to do that than to walk up a country lane you know mm -hmm. where the only thing passing you is going to be maybe a tractor and the only thing to distract you is the beauty of the environment you know mm -hmm. uh, so even though people disagree, I think there isn't really a better place than here. Plus, um, Marshall's, Marshall McLuhan's papers, uh, early work journals, are at the National Archive in Ottawa. And his annotated library is at the University of Toronto. And here we are in Prince Edward County. And it forms a kind of triangle, mm -hmm. um, which I find fun and interesting. So when people come to this area to study McLuhan and his works, um, and they'll go to Toronto and they'll go to Ottawa. It's not really a stretch for them to come here. So that's another occurrence of group. It is, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. And can you explain again about the logo and the three in the logo? Yeah. So um, the McLuhan Institute um, has this logo here, which I created. And it's a, a W for Winnipeg with a pigeon sitting on top because um, Marshall McLuhan grew up in Winnipeg and was fond of calling himself a Winnipigian, which is not something other people call themselves as far as I know. Um, so I created this logo to, to draw attention to the Winnipigian aspect. And for the McLuhan Institute, because I'm taking things in a different direction, I'm taking it out of academia, I'm bringing it into the culture again, into the wider culture. So I'm turning things on their head a little bit flipping the bird if you want, and it's an M for McLuhan. Um, and that is, that is my focus. 
Um, I'm less interested in theory than in practical. I'm interested in especially um, what we can use from the work to understand technology and its effects today and going forward to tomorrow. Um, because as long as we continue to innovate and create new technologies, we will uh, have a need, which is becoming more and more desperate all the time, to understand the implications on ourselves. Um, and I truly believe that we can do more than just uh, look at the effects after the matter, that um, we have the tools available to us to understand what technologies will do. Um, and that's one of the things that Marshall and Eric did in their lifetimes was create a series of tools for understanding the effects of technologies, not just looking back, but looking today and looking forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that is this idea of media ecology, that um, technologies create an environment of effects and that um, we have the ability to uh, be better custodians rather than just dealing with the fallout. In the same way that we're trying to um, fix our physical ecology and our global environment, which is heating up, um, we can also be better stewards of our technological environments, um, which is an idea loosely called media ecology. Mm -hmm. So my focus with the McLuhan Institute is not so much in creating a museum and a monument, although it is important to know what's happened and to educate ourselves and to learn what we can from the past, but um, I think we need less monu fewer monuments and more tools um, to help us today and tomorrow. So my, um, one of the reasons for my starting McLuhan Institute is as a formal umbrella, uh, a place with which to enter into that study and drawing out these tools, um, making them comprehensible and teachable, and then passing them on. And it's important to me to do this outside of academia, not because I have much against academia, but because um, the academic environment is a very insular and small environment. Um, and it's really uh, the rest of the world who are dealing day to day with the fallout from technology. And you need to understand that um, there are ways of understanding it. And with understanding comes agency. And I believe we all have a role to play in making the world a better place. And that also includes technologically. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning that you were going to be running seminars here. Yeah, so one thing I do is um, I give lectures and teach classes um, kind of around the world, not to sound grandiose about it, but, uh, you know, I give lectures at universities and places and um, one of the reasons for creating the McLuhan Institute is to be a place to be able to teach these things. Mm -hmm. So this um, McLuhan Institute satellite, as I'm calling it, um, is a, a microcosm of that and a bit of a test case. And so instead of going out into the world to teach, I'm inviting the world to come here to teach. So um, people who might be visiting Wellington from Toronto or people who might live here and are interested in learning more can come and I have a menu of topics um, and they can choose one and I'll give them a one-on-one -on -one, um, lecture or class for 20 minutes or something. Um, or if they just have some questions and want to ask me anything, we can do that. Um, and the other thing I'm doing is, um, you know, it's a kind of a, a strange time to be opening a space to welcome people into, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously not everybody can come here from anywhere else, but one of the things um, which are a consequence of our current technological environment is this rush and necessity to bring things online, especially teaching. Okay. So I'm offering virtual visits to the McLuhan Institute. Okay. So using my smartphone, um, I'll start a Zoom call or a Facebook or you know FaceTime or whatever with people and give them a tour of the place and allow them to interact with me one-on-one uh, -on -one virtually. Um, and that also increases my reach greatly. So I haven't done that yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Pardon me, if anybody's interested, they can email me satellite at the McLuhan Institute dot com uh, and arrange for a time to have a, a virtual or in-person visit. Wonderful. Yeah. Now you are giving workshops for kids as well, right? For class, classroom workshops. Yeah, yes. yeah. The, the topics which I teach um, are for all ages. 
some topics are more advanced or difficult than others. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been gratified to find that you can teach introductory um, uh, thoughts on the effects of technologies to children as young as grade five and six. Okay. I haven't tried too much younger than that. Yeah. Um, I've taught at a school here in Prince Edward County. I've taught at a school in Toronto, grade five, six class. Yeah. Um, and I basically taught them what the medium is, the message means, okay. through an exercise called figure and ground. Uh, figure and ground <clears throat> are terms which um, a Danish psychologist, Edgar Rubin, came up with in 1915 or so. He was with a Gestalt school of psychology. Um, and he came up with these terms to describe um, the uh, components of uh, the structure of visible phenomena. Okay. So, for example, in a painting, um, you have a, a figure, which is the object of attention, and then you have a ground, which is the background, right. okay, which is everything else you're not focused on. Um, and this is uh, psychologically, uh, we tend to focus on one thing uh, and everything else remains in a sort of periphery. And it's a dynamic relationship because I'm looking at the camera now and now you're in my periphery and then I'm switching back and forth, right? So it's a dynamic changing environment. Well, Marshall, uh, appro Marshall McLuhan appropriated these terms to um, describe the more invisible environment that accompanies the technology. Mm. So for example, um, the smartphone we will consider as our figure. And the ground of the smartphone is, uh, is huge, um, but it's very difficult to look at it all at once. Mm -hmm. So what I do is um, I have a whiteboard over there, or I'll use a blackboard and I'll, I'll explain these terms to the children and I'll say, now, help me describe what the ground would be of the smartphone. And this works with them because they all have one, mm -hmm. generally, 99% of them do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll say, what do you need in order for this device to function? And that's part of the ground. So um, they'll start saying things like, you know, power, electricity. So we'll put that on the board. And they'll say, um, Wi-Fi. So we'll put that on the board. And with Wi-Fi, they'll start saying, internet and networks and cell phone towers and um, you know then we decide oh well we need um, component parts so we need manufacturing and we need mining and we need um, technology and expertise and then we need education and we start very quickly to fill up these board and part of my job is to arrange things on the board so that you can see the relationships between them um, because of course they're all they're all connected, being an environment, but they all have relationships between each other as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get a, a board full of things. Of course, the effects of technologies go beyond um, just physical effects, like what do we need to make a smartphone and the power. It also comprises of psychological effects. Mm -hmm. um, one of the major uh, ways that technology works, technology like the smartphone, is they reorganize our relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. um, for the children, it reorganizes how they interact even on the playground, mm -hmm. um, how they interact outside of school time. Mm -hmm. So, but it's very difficult for them to consider these things. So what we do is we get this board full of things. And then there's a way for, for finding the more invisible things, and that's by taking the figure out of the ground or by taking the ground out of the figure. So I say, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and this didn't work and it never would work again because we have no more internet. Let's say some weird thing happened and there's never going to be any more internet. And the grade five and six kids will just go, <gasps> because they don't know anything else. You know, you and I can remember a time when these didn't run our lives like they do now, literally run our lives. Mm -hmm. um, if smartphones were to go down now and they were never to come back up, we would be in a very perilous situation, mm -hmm. uh, especially even right now when we've grown to demand uh, to rely on these more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So I, I challenge these children to think about what the consequences are if this is 
abruptly taking out of our lives. And that shock shows us how entrenched it's become in our lives. Mm -hmm. So no longer can they use these to communicate with each other, to check in with their parents, to go on TikTok, to look at YouTube, to learn about things, to Google something. Mm -hmm. um, it completely disrupts everything they know about living. Um, and that is part of the social effect and the psychological effect because they just thinking about that produces an anxiety. Right. And anxiety, uh, the increase in anxiety is a very large consequence of this technology, of the apps, the notification, the way apps are designed to occupy attention, the way they're designed to um, give these dopamine rewards, you know, um, and when you take those away, it has a serious psychological effect. So um, we finish with that fun exercise. <laughs> and then I say to them, and that's what the medium is the message means. Because it is the medium, medium meaning environment or ground, because ground is another name for medium and this medium is the message equation. Now that you understand what ground means, you understand what medium means and why it's this environment that is what we need to pay attention to more than you and I talking on wherever this video ends up. That's not going to change the world. But this sure changed the world. Mm -hmm. And it changed it regardless of you and I talking right now or anything else that happens on it, but by the sum total of effects that create this environment. And that's why the medium is the message. And they say, oh, yeah. Duh, right? <laughs> and it's interesting that when Marshall first said that in 1958 and for decades after, people, you know, what do you mean the media? No, you know, the message is the message. What do you mean the content, you know? Of course the content is the message. And it's like, no, it's, uh, you know, content is important, obviously. Content has a role to play. Content has effect. Um, propaganda, uh, you know, social engineering. A lot of things happen because of content, for sure. But compared to the environmental effect of the technology itself without the content, it's negligible. Uh, and there's another quote that I'll drop on them, and that's um, uh, this guy, um, John Culkin from New York City, wrote an article um, back in the 60s about Marshall McLuhan where he said, uh, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And this was John Culkin who said this, not Marshall, although a lot of people think Marshall McLuhan said it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll end the talk with that too. I'll say now you understand why we create a technology, but then this technology completely recreates um, who we are physiologically, psychically. Um, it affects our sensory lives. It affects our social lives. And it affects our society. It remakes everything in its own image. Um, and that's how we shape our tools, and thereafter they shape us. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very, it's McLuhan 101. Mm -hmm. It's at heart, when you understand it, you see it's a very simple concept, um, but it's also a very complex mm -hmm. um, idea as well. Um, what's great for me is being able to go into a grade five, six class and teach this to them, and they get it. Right. They all get it. It's obvious. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 60 years after Marshall first said it, it's obvious mm -hmm. uh, instead of crazy. Mm -hmm. And that goes to show how far we've come societally. Um, ironically, we are now in an environment in which that is obvious. Uh, and a lot of that has to do just with our technological situation, with the, the rapid amount of change and the speed of change it's become things become obvious that weren't before mm -hmm. there's a great quote that uh, somebody said if they only turned up the bath water half a degree every hour we wouldn't know when to scream mm -hmm. you know yeah. here they've turned the heat up mm -hmm. uh, especially in this coronavirus time the heat was turned way up right. and it became a lot of our technological circumstance became very obvious uh, both the limitations and the opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's it's a positive and negative that we live in the times that we live in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're dealing or not dealing with massive technological change, um, but because it is so massive and rapid, means that we can see it. Mm 
-hmm. So um, what we now have to do is do something about it. And people, I think, feel a certain sense of despair or, you know, this word phrase technological determinism, determinism comes, comes up that, um, you know, yeah, but there's nothing we can do about it. Of course, there's something we can do about it. Uh, we got ourselves into this mess. Um, we designed ourselves into this mess. Mm -hmm. And we can design ourselves out of it um, by understanding how technologies work and by making smarter choices when we design them and when we implement them. Mm -hmm. That's what media ecology is all about. I see. Yeah. So, and in my small part, uh, that's kind of the gospel I'm preaching is um, trying to raise awareness um, that, uh, you know, we're in trouble, um, but give hope, not despair, because, uh, you know, there are ways out. Mm -hmm. Are you the first person to interpret it from grade five and six level? In I don't know. Uh, that's um, probably not. Uh, I think I, uh, media literacy, as they call it, uh, is a subject that's taught to very young ages. Uh -huh. But media literacy and media ecology are different things. Yeah. Media literacy generally in the field, in schools, means teaching kids how to use iPads. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, this is not teaching them uh, the effects of these technologies, the implications of them. This is creating more users, mm -hmm. which um, although I think people's hearts are in the right place, I don't think is very helpful. Right. Yeah. So um, I advocate less for media literacy and more for media criticism or media ecology. Uh, because uh, I think if you're just teaching people how to become better addicts, I'm not sure how helpful that is. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously we live in the world we live in. Um, we need to use the tools that our society is geared to using. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need to teach, um, you know, the other sides of the coin mm -hmm. um, and give people some agency because, um, you know, uh, we don't have to, uh, you know, Marshall said, I choose not to simply lie down and let the juggernaut roll over me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we know that um, technologies uh, rewire our brains. Um, they affect our senses, and when you affect one sense, you affect all of your senses. Um, it's uh, neuroscience is a discipline um, centered around understanding how the brain changes depending on our inputs. Um, and we know that it's not like a one and done thing. Uh, of course, the technologies you're exposed to, um, the ways of perception you grow up around, uh, affect the formation of your brain and how you'll go forward in your life. But we also know. Um, a concept called neuroplasticity, which means it ain't over, yeah. you know. Um, a new technology comes around and uh, new people and new society are the result, um, proving that we can change. Um, we can do that on purpose instead of as a side effect, right? So what I advocate for is what kind of brain do you want to have? What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to have raw nerves? Do you want to have uh, no ability to function and concentrate, uh, sustained concentration on a, sim on a single task? Mm -hmm. uh, reading. Most people don't read a lot because it's hard to read now. Mm -hmm. It's hard to read, to focus on a book. Um, people don't understand that reading on a screen and reading on a page are different things. Mm -hmm. They are very different things. One thing the light is coming through. Another thing, the light is reflected, reflected off, and these have very different physiologic and neurologic right. um, effects. Um, if you want to help your attention, read more and read a book. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't necessarily matter what you read even, which yeah. is the funny thing, because coming back to the idea of the medium being a message, it's not so much the, you know, what you're reading, but right. how you're reading. So, um, you know, if it's easier for you to read a Harlequin romance, read a Harlequin romance. If it's easier for you to read the newspaper, read the newspaper, but read it on paper mm -hmm. and as much as you can. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's one way that you can balance your own ecology. Right. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a prescription for freeing yourself from whatever technological bondage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know uh, because, you know, I'm not a, any kind of doctor or scientist. I don't even know to what extent it works, but I know that it works. Yeah. Um, and I think if you experiment, you'll find the same thing. Um, especially in a, I'm, I'm ramming this, this home because especially in a time like this when, um, although it's opening up now, people have been forced to rely more and more and more on digital and screen technologies because you couldn't go to the library, for example. You couldn't go to the classroom. Uh, I happen to live surrounded by books, so I have no shortage of reading material and I'm lucky. Um, but uh, for other people, they've had to rely more and more on screens. And I think if you analyze what's been happening in the world the last few months, you'll see a rise in certain, um, you know, human behaviors, uh, emotions, um, and different things, which, uh, you know, are the result of things like that, of our technological circumstance and raising that temperature mm -hmm. through the roof. Mm -hmm. So, um, as much as it's possible to balance, I advocate for balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and go on an experiment, you know. Think of it as, as a media diet. And the thing is, unplugging isn't enough. You know, um, if you want to cultivate uh, the kinds of things which were, um, you know, a result of, of widespread literacy in decades and centuries past, you need to go back there and you need to use those technologies and people need to understand what a technology is because technology doesn't end with a plug you know um, our opposable thumb is a technology you know my watch which doesn't have a battery but runs on um, bumpers inside that wind as you move okay. that's a technology the pencil is a technology uh, your fork and spoon are technologies these are things which, um, you know, have effects on us psychically, socially, um, sensorily, uh, and consider the kind of effect you want and head to that uh, tool. Books, uh, the printed word, the alphabet, these are very, very sophisticated um, and effectual uh, technologies. You know, they, uh, when the alphabet came in, in ancient Greece, it revolutionized things and it wasn't universally accepted. You know, people were not thrilled about it. It meant the end of oral society right. and the birth of a new society, which, you know, was great for several centuries, a couple millennia almost, right. but um, it did end a way of life and people weren't thrilled about that. Right. So I'm not simply saying if we're going to teach people how to use computers, we have to teach them media literacy and ecology because the same thing goes no matter what we're teaching them. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very simplistic view of technology to think it ends at a, the end of a power cord. Yeah. Um, but So I, I really advocate, regardless of how young we're teaching them iPads, um, we need to start to teach our kids um, the effects of technologies if we ever want to be in a society that, um, you know, does something about uh, technology before um, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. So do you actually get into anything about neuroplasticity with them? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, again, I, I haven't studied neuroscience yeah. <laughs> all that all that much. Yeah. Um, I bring it up for you and I, yeah. not necessarily for, you know, no, eight-year-olds. Really. Yeah. So I'll bring That's it up. Funny. And just the same way I did with you, I'll mm -hmm. say there's a science called, you know, there's okay. something called neuroscience yeah. where we study the effect of the brain. Uh, and I'll teach them the idea that input in, effect out, you know. Um, I won't use terms like census communis, which is uh, the fancy term for the way our senses operate as their own ecology. Okay. Um, there's a, you know, you hear about people who went blind later in life, and all of a sudden they can't see. Mm -hmm. And they talk about how all of a sudden their, their oral acuity goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, or their, their, their sense of touch becomes heightened. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you affect one sense, you affect them all. This right. equilibrium among senses, which is called the sensus communis.
Um, and that happens when you cut somebody's eyesight out. That's this raising of that temperature. But it also happens um, when you sit in front of a screen six, eight, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're uh, overemphasizing that input um, and it affects your other senses, um, which then affects your nerves and, you know, everything else from there on out. Exactly. So um, I don't go into that level <laughs> with them. Um, but um, it's all about um, shedding a little bit of light, you know, planting seed, adding a bit of water, a bit of light. And seeing what can grow from there. Is there anything you offer them as a takeaway for when they have to utilize this information they just received in their daily life? Any little exercises they take home or um, like sort of wrap up with them? I do that for, for other classes for older grades when yeah. we get a little more deeply into specific effects of technologies. Okay. For children that young, uh, I mean, I'm not about to give them homework. No. Hopefully, um, if I've done my job, I've stimulated their curiosity, okay. right? And then they go from there, okay. you know? Hopefully, this um, stays with them and it's not like on to lunch or on to snack and recess. And yeah. uh, when their parents ask them what they did at school today, you know, it was, I don't know. You know, yeah, yeah. hopefully it's the beginning of a conversation, an inner dialogue, mm -hmm. even if it's not at the conscious level. Yeah. Hopefully it's at the conscious level yeah. um, because that is what it's about. Uh -huh. um, but my job ends when I leave the classroom and then it's up to them and to their teacher. Yeah. Um, it's up and I don't want to put too much on teachers because uh, you know, they have a very, very closed system within which to operate and there isn't a lot of wiggle room for them. Yeah. It's not like they can all of a sudden decide to focus their, their kids' attention on media studies, right? right. Like it's not possible. Yeah. Um, so hopefully all I can do is hope to inspire their curiosity and, and wonder and uh, that they'll take it from there. Yeah. That's great. Yes. It just sounds like such a, it would be wonderful to be in that class <laughs> with all these excited kids who are discovering the uh, You know what, it's the best thing. Um, I love teaching, I love speaking to people. Um, I, you know, want to do it more and more and more. So if anybody's watching this, reach out to me at the McLuhan Institute com, and uh, bring me.